So I always like to uh, introduce our, my Stanford colleagues because, you know, most of the time, you know, we see each other in committee meetings and, you know, looking at graduate files and doing all sorts of busy work, and we, we forget how, how brilliant we all are. Uh, and, and Gordon is, is, is no exception. In fact, he's the paradigm. He's the professor of American history and the Olive H. Palmer Professor in Humanities. He's also the director of uh, the Center for East Asian Studies, and he was also the first director of Asian American Studies here at Stanford. In fact, he helped not only found Asian American Studies, but CSRE, so he's had a proven leadership uh, skills and talents from the very beginning of his, his uh, tenure here at Stanford. Uh, his particular area of interest is Trans-Pacific Relations, the interconnections between East Asia and America, treating the political, social, and cultural interactions from the earliest days of America to the present. And I urge uh, all of you students, in fact, some of our faculty, to uh, take a course that he's offering this winter called The Pacific World, uh, in which he'll address a lot of the issues that he'll um, talk about today and more. He's a prolific and wide-ranging scholar, and he has so many books on his resume, I'm not going to read them all. But I will uh, read off some titles to sort of give you a sense of his breadth, which is, is quite astounding. He's the author or editor of a number of books, uh, including Friends and Enemies, The United States, China, and the Soviet Union, uh, 1948 to 1972, Morning Glory, Evening Shadow, Yamato Ichi Ichihashi and His Interment Writings, Asian Americans and Politics, Perspectives, Experiences, uh, Prospects, uh, Asian American Art History, so he's very well versed in the field of art history, Chinese Railroad Workers, which is part of a long um, standing uh, project that he has helped organize here at Stanford and is an amazing transnational project of historical recovery and advocacy. And I, I don't want us to lose sight of uh, Gordon's role in being an advocate and activist in all of his scholarships. So please follow the development of the Chinese Railroad Workers um, uh, Project. I don't know if you know that Richard Saller in his State of the uh, School address yesterday specifically mentioned that. So I wanted to, to call that in particular. And finally, the book that he'll be talking about today, Fateful Ties, A History of America's Preoccupation with China. Gordon Chang has been and continues to be an indispensable resource for us here at Stanford in all these scholarly activities as well as his leadership roles in the academy and on the national and international scene. So we're very, very privileged to have Gordon here today to tell us about his latest work. So please join me in welcoming Gordon Chang. Thank you, David, for that uh, very kind, flatter <laughs> uh, uh, introduction. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mariam. Thank you, CSRE for uh, hosting this and uh, Cease and others who have co-sponsored. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, CSRE, CCSRE is a, a second home for me and it's uh, wonderful to see so many good colleagues that I haven't seen as much in the past couple of years. Uh, Cheryl, okay, you're all right with this? All right, well, let, what I, I'm not gonna do uh, what's sometimes done in, in book talks, which is to read from the book, which I find not very <laughs> stimulating, but rather I'm going to sort of uh, summarize some of the book, give you some of the background for how it came to be, and to uh, give you some of the content, but you have a lot of images here to sort of illustrate the, some of the arguments and some of the points that I try to make in the book. Now, um, David mentioned a couple of the books that uh, I've, I've, I've issued before, and I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, my intellectual history, my trajectory of how I got to this point. Uh, I originally started out in Chinese history here in graduate school at Stanford many, many years ago and overlapped with a colleague here, Ming Chan. We were both in the, uh, in the, in the history department. But I didn't, uh, Ming stuck it through. I didn't stick it, stick it out. And I left after a year and a half uh, to do other things. Join the revolution. Yeah, join, join the revolution. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> Ming, Ming will speak for me. So that's what I did for a long time, and I, I, after 10 years or more, I came back, <laughs> and um, then I switched to U.S. history. So I've continued to sort of have interest in both fields to span both those areas. Now, my first, uh, my, uh, first book, which, uh, upon, uh, which came out of my dissertation, uh, was a book that really looked at high-level thinking 
about the triangular relationship between the Soviet Union, China, and the, and, and the United States as sort of a background history to Nixon's trip to China, which occurred in 1972, which has been said to sort of acknowledge the, the tensions between China and the Soviet Union and the US uh, um, taking advantage or exploiting that, relate, that split in the communist world. But this, this book sort of looks at the history of this triangular relationship, the big power relationship. Um, and uh, for some, some of you who are in Asian studies or Chinese history, uh, so it sort of plays on the romance of the three kingdoms, you know, uh, which, uh, which is interesting as also as a sort of a study of uh, geopolitics. But the book continues to have a resonance and uh, has been translated several times in China. Most recently, uh, this is the cover of the most recent non-pirated edition <laughs> in, in, in China. But, um, and as you can see, or those who can read Chinese, you can see that this title in Chinese is rendered differently than in the English, and it's a more pointed title. I think my book sort of is more historical and sort of suggests the ability to become a friend or an enemy or vice versa. But in the Chinese title is translated is friend or foe, question mark. So you're either one or the other. And so it's sort of a more contemporary um, uh, focus. But as David mentioned, I've worked on other things, including Asian American history and Chinese American history in particular. Uh, and since the time of working at the geopolitical level, I've moved further and further away from that uh, focus to look more at social and cultural history and trans-Pacific histories. Uh, so therefore, the, the, and these are two of the books that have come out of that drifting or that migrating interest. Um, I think that what pulls these different studies together is now what I would call my interest more in the, what I would say, the mental context of international relations or trans-Pacific relations. So it's not, uh, I'm not interested just in calculations of strategic or political or economic or military matters, but I'm interested in patterns of thinking and attitudes, values, biases, and assumptions, and how they underlie uh, how nations and peoples interact with each other. Um, one could say that, therefore, I'm moving away from political history to thinking more and more about cultural, ideo cultural or ideological or mentality history. Um, and I'm also trying to think more and more about long-term historical interactions. And I think today's talk is, su suggests that I'm trying to talk about the long history of America-China relations. And by my long, I mean going back to Christopher Columbus to today. Um, so I'm looking at about hundreds of years and looking at patterns and connections and developments over a long span of time and not just the short span of a political history. So this book uh, uh, that I have uh, issued is, one might say, a book about mentalite, and the durable mental attitude that helps explain uh, past and present fascinations with China in America. Now, this book came about because several years ago, it was five, six years ago, an editor at Harvard University Press called me up and said, Gordon, will you recommend some names of authors who can write a book about the history of U.S.-China relations? Because already there was so much interest in this topic, and she wanted to have my advice of who would be good to commission for such a study. So I gave her different names, and then she came back to me a week or so later, and she said, no, I don't like any of them. Why don't you do it? <laughs> so. And so she was very persuasive, as, as Estelle knows, or, and I think Anna knows, you know, we know have a shared editor, this person is very persuasive, and she got me into the book, and I said, I thought to myself, yeah, I should do this, because if I don't do it, I'm not going to do it, and, and, and this is sort of like a culmination of a career's uh, interest in U.S.-China relations. But then I thought, well, what am I going to say, because there are so many books about U.S.-China relations, and I said, well, look, I'm a historian, so why don't I write a history book? and a history book that um, will speak to this current fascination in America about China. And so what the book is, is a history of now, is a history of the present moment, uh, which is to say that today ch you look around and China's everywhere in every newspaper and the web pages, everything of this sort. So there's a fascination, a preoccupation with, they, they wanted to, you, the Harvard Press wanted to put uh, uh, obsession with China in the title. I said it was a little strong. But this is to give some history of the present moment. So 
that's how um, th this book came about. Now, so I want to tell you how I approached this book by showing a, a few images that may surprise you. So we'll start off with this one. Oh, did I make a mistake? <laughs> oh, this, this is another lecture. No, no, this is the right one. Who, who are these people? Where are they? And when was this taken? If you know the answer, does anyone know the answer? Don't, don't shout it out quite yet. No one knows. No one knows. You, you, you know? No, no, don't yell it out yet. Just, just say, I want to see how au courant you all are. You know, and, and you're reading your society pages or entertainment pages. All right, so this is Beyonce and Jay-Z, right? On the red carpet somewhere, looking very elegant, okay? Uh, Custom-made gown for Beyonce. Uh, continuation of the same evening. Rihanna, you know, front cover of the New York Times magazine this past Sunday. Beautiful gown, some people think. Uh, <laughs> by, designed by Chinese designer. People, when it came out and she appeared, and of course the critics pan, they pan everything like this. And they said, look like a walking egg omelet or something <laughs> like that. Or, you know, too much cheese on the pizza or something like this. But that's beyond. And then uh, Sarah Jessica Parker looking very unsexy in the city here in this uh, getup. And I had to throw in a guy, and there's Justin Bieber. So, uh, but if you're looking, if anybody can, can get the gist of this, you know, looking at what, look at their gowns, don't look at the celebrities themselves is what will give it away. And then the ever-president Kim Kardashian is also here showing herself, or too much of herself, again, as usual. And uh, elegant Kate Hudson here, all the same event. Well, that, now who knows where this is? The Met, Met Gala, back in May of this uh, past spring, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York opened a blockbuster show, three, three floors of the museum, 300 items displayed to show, uh, to explore the influence, they say, of China on Western fashion. And it was one of the biggest shows uh, in their history, I think second only to King Tut, uh, uh, this. But um, it was um, purported to show, as I said, the influence or the, the connections between stylistic idioms and fashion, Chinese art and aesthetics, and a Western fashion. And this was sort of the cover page of the, of the uh, program here, China Through the Looking Glass, which I think is a nice title. So it sort of suggests both a mirror as well as something that's sort of transformative, as Alice in Wonderland type of thing is a little bit disorienting, but it's also a reflection on self. And even this graphic over here is, I think, interesting. It, it looks sort of like a blue and white porcelain Ming da, uh, va vase, but it's actually a dress. So th this is sort of the theme. Now, 800,000 people came to this, and they had to extend it a month longer, and it ended just last month. Um, but when I see th this show, or when I think about the show, I think about other things. I think about in 1838, uh, when, um, when uh, a wealthy uh, Philadelphian, Nathan Dunn, opened his Chinese museum with the first big show about China in America. Uh, in 1838, Nathan Dunn had made his money in the China trade and brought back hundreds, maybe a thousand or two items from China and opened up this big museum in Philadelphia to display uh, everyday wear, fashions, paintings, implements, artwork, and so forth about China to a very fascinated American audience. Um, 100, 100,000 people in 1838 in Philadelphia, over three years, attended that museum show. So the Met show is not new. I mean, it's a, it, it, it brings up the echo, in my mind, of this earlier moment. I also think about um, uh, Helen Taft and uh, Julia Grant. Julia Grant being Ulysses S. Grant's wife and Helen uh, Taft being uh, William Howard Taft's wife, and at their inaugural balls for the, the presidents, they both wore gowns inspired by Chinese fashion. Um, and if you go to the Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., and you go up to the third floor or whatever it is, and there's a big room there that shows the first, the gowns of the first ladies 
presented, and you can see these gowns. They're very interesting. So that resonated with me uh, about the, this show and making these connections. I also look at things like this, which some of you have seen in business pages. And who knows where this is? Shanghai. Shanghai, all right. This is in the opening of flagship store of Apple, one of the flagship stores of Apple. They went into China big in the, a few years ago, and now there are scores of these big Apple stores. Apple is, is huge in China. I kind of like it because it sort of reminds me of I.M. Pei's crystal pyramid in the, in, the, in the plaza of the Louvre, where you go into the Louvre and you go down. So this is sort of a round, but it sort of has a hologram up there of the Apple, and you go down into the Apple store. When this store opened, Tim Cook was in China, the CEO of, C of, of Apple, said the sky's the limit for Apple in China. And he said one day, Apple will sell more products in China than in the rest of the world, or certainly in the United States. And already last year, 30% of Apple's revenue, 30% of Apple's rev total revenue came just from sales in China alone. So approaching the sales in the United States. Google, 30% of Apple sales in China is already surpasses the worldwide revenue of Google. Let me show you some sense of this. Um, and Apple has big, many fans in China. This was uh, people waiting to get into that store. And the store, uh, some of you may have been in it, is probably like the downtown Palo Alto store. It may be five times the size of that store, something like that. It's, it's huge. And they have many of these in Beijing and in, in Shanghai and other cities. Other business elites uh, are fascinated about China. Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates are interested in China beyond ping pong. Uh, as we've seen them in here, and both of them have marveled at about the Chinese economy and the growth over the past 20 years. They're big investors in China, and they have many interests in China. Uh, but as I look about this bi current business interest, it speaks to me about the long-standing American interest of uh, commercial ties with China, going back to the earliest days of the U.S., which I'll talk about in a moment, the old China trade. Well, all is not positive and sort of glowing in this relationship by any means. And you can see by some of the titles of books I've just pulled off the internet that speak to what is commonly called the China threat. And the China threat is, sells a lot of books, probably a lot more books than my book <laughs> will sell, that people want to read about this China threat. Uh, on Saturday, I spoke to Homecoming, and a big crowd of over 300 alums came back, and, and it was in Coverly and um, it was overflow, overflow cloud. And a lot of the questions at the end of the session had to deal with, with, uh, with the, these fears and anxieties about what China is and what it means for the United States and, and in, in sort of a, uh, really playing upon the threatening aspect of, of China, this fear of China. And you can see there's a, these motifs in the, in the book, these themes in the book t covers are, are so strong. I, I didn't pick these for any particular purpose, uh, other than the titles were sort of uh, uh, extreme, but all of a sudden you look at them and they all sound the same, and they all sort of look the same, they all have snarling dragons on, on the cover. And the contents of these, by many ways, are very similar. They all play upon each other and speak to these, these fears. Um, and for some of the colleagues who know about the yellow peril, you know, they really use a lot of the language of the yellow peril. So even more of these kind of sort of books about dragons and, and danger and war and all this thing coming about. I sort of like this book over here title you know, about being unbalanced, you know, the codependency of America and China. I think that's kind of a humorous way of talking about it. I think there might be actually something there that the two are locked into maybe an unhealthy relationship. Well, now, uh, that's sort of the current moment. This is the now. Uh, but I go back in the book to look at some of the long history in this interaction. Uh, and I look at particular moments. I go back to James. I begin with, uh, actually, Christopher Columbus, which I'll get to in a moment. But I'll uh, talk about the Jamestown. Jamestown, the first, uh, hopefully, uh, hoped uh, permanent settlement, British settlement in North America. Uh, there were two, two mandates for the Jamestown colonists. One was to find gold, 
And the second was to find the passage to Asia, find the Northwest Passage, the passage through this damned continent, which is what they believed. They didn't know, they, they didn't know why in the heck did God create this immense, this continent to block European access to Europe. And they, they were convinced that there had to be some passage through this continent because this continent really didn't mean very much for them at the time, despite what our high school history textbooks talk about, the new world discovery and development of it and so forth. But it, it, you can see this also, these important moments of where China is embedded in American history, such as that here with the uh, boss, famous Boston Tea Party, which incites and in, in, in sparks the American uh, re rebellion and to revolution in the Boston, where Bostonians, uh, whites presumably dress up as Native Americans, raid uh, these ships in Boston Harbor that are loaded with tea and dump them overboard because they don't like taxation without representation. Well, the t what is being taxed is tea from China. And what this tea is all about is from Fujian, which is, makes a lot of the oolong tea. When you go to a Chinese restaurant, you probably drink oolong tea. Americans drank principally tea at the time. Coffee was not a, co a commodity of choice at the time. But tea became a symbol of the imposition of uh, what they believed were unfair taxes uh, on colonists to help support uh, the British Empire. And so the ish even the issue, the control of the China trade by London was one, basic, one of the basic uh, motivating um, f forces within the American Revolution itself. Americans wanted access to China directly rather than have to go through London. Now this is uh, symbolized by a very interesting moment, which is after the revolution is won, Americans are now celebrate, and this is a 20th century uh, rendering of this moment. On February 22nd, 1784, George Washington's birthday, coming out of New York Harbor are two ships illustrated in this painting. The first ship, which is the first ship to leave an American harbor flying the star, new stars and stripes, as you can see prominently right in the middle of the painting. Well, right in the middle of the painting. And it's called, the, the ship is the Empress of China. And it's leaving New York Harbor to go to Canton because it wants to tap into that China trade. Interestingly, behind the ship, second to this merchant ship is a ship carrying a very valuable document, which is the ratified Treaty of Paris that ends the hostilities between the colonies and London. It's the peace treaty. It grants America independence. But it is second, the ship is behind the Empress of China. And this, the other ship is going to London with the Continental Congress signatures on the, on the treaty. So this gives you, this was, this was outfitted, one of the principal uh, backers of this was Edmund Morris, the financier of the revolution has said. What do you think was on this ship? Because Americans wanted to buy things from China. At the time, Amer American homes were full of China ware. Elite homes were full of China ware. If you go to Mount Vernon or Monticello and so forth, you see the American elites had very fine China ware commissioned with family seals and, and banners and so forth on these ships. But also, everyday Americans had lots of Chinese-made items, furniture, homeware goods. I say China was sort of like the IKEA of the day. It already was. And it's no coincidence that you go to IKEA today and you see China stuff. And there's a connection between this export tradition and talent, if you will, or, or a mentality uh, 200 years ago in what we have today and coming from very similar regions of China. But the well, Americans are buying <clears throat> this stuff, but they want to sell something to China you know, to make sure the trade is somewhat balanced. What do you think is on this ship to China? Furs is a good guess. You know, Americans were selling furs and had lots of furs here. Cotton, cotton no, often good guesses, but wrong. Uh, you know, tobacco and cotton are not very big crops yet in the United States, but it's good. Uh, some people think guns, which is a good guess. You know, exporting guns already back then. You know, but 
actually what was on board the ship is American ginseng. You know, it's talk about you know, Coles to Newcastle or something like this. There's a ginseng to China, and that's because Americans knew that the Chinese men liked ginseng, and there's plenty of ginseng that grows wild in the Adirondacks. And native peoples had gathered ginseng and used it for medicinal purposes. The French learned from the Indians about this, and the Americans commissioned uh, India, got the trade, and gathered tons of this stuff to put on board to take to China. This, this poster actually comes from Chinatown in San Francisco. I saw it one day and I had to, took a picture of it. But it was American ginseng that was on its way to China. Well, this China trade was immensely profitable before and after the revolution, way up into the 19th century. It was one of the principal stays of the American economy, which there were two of. One was the slave trade in the Atlantic and in the China trade. Those are the two big mainstays of the early American economy, and made the fortunes of the blue bloods of New England. Um, and here are just a few. And you look at the names down here, and some of you have been to Harvard, you know Harvard, and the houses at Harvard, Cabot, Lowell, Brown University, Delano, Franklin Delano, Roosevelt, Russell's, Astor, John Jacob Astor, who was the wealthiest man in America for many, many years, and his name still it evokes uh, uh, luxury, the Waldorf Astoria, or place such as uh, Astoria, Oregon, which was the first permanent American settlement on the west coast of uh, the continent at the mouth of the Columbia River because John Jacob Astor was a fur trader and he commissioned with native peoples and others to gather pelts, uh, in particular at that time, the poor sea otter who almost gets decimated from an ear down in the ear down in your neck of the woods. The poor little beautiful old sea otter almost is wiped out by British and American and Russian uh, trappers. And they send all these value, very, very, very valuable pelts to China when the Chinese elite liked them because they were so warm. And if you've been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, you know that one million and one square inch of sea otter pelt has a million hairs in it. I does I got that right? Okay. All right. So these people made money. And then, of course, we know here that our university is founded on a fortune of Leland Stanford, who made his fortune in large part over being the main director of the Central Pacific Railroad, who employed principally Chinese workers. So there was also direct connections here. And this was the painting that you here see at the Cantor Art Center showing the uh, Palo Alto Springs, which was their mansion before it burned down over sort of near where the shopping center is. And you see Leland and Jane and Junior there. And then you have some fans. All the others are Stanford family, and they're all identified, except for the servants. Of course, the workers are never given any identities. They don't have any names. They're just their fans. But the artist sort of puts them in, which is interesting in the painting. And I think they're both Chinese. Uh, service because that's who the, it's in, the, in the Stanford home they had all Asian or Chinese uh, uh, servants. Well, uh, at the same time, there was also great animosity and fear about Chinese inundating America. And there were a racial backlash against the coming of Chinese to the United States, which is sort of illustrated in this magazine cover this cover uh, magazine published in San Francisco. And you can see here literally a devilish looking Chinese person, uh, not sort of human, and with all sorts of arms um, degrading, exploiting, uh, oppressing white Americans, taking jobs away from them, stealing, spreading opium, seducing white women, uh, all sorts of things up here. This is the scourge on white civilization. So even as Leland Stanford's trying to bring in Chinese workers here, others, including Stanford himself, at times goes back and forth and plays to the anti-Chinese movement. And this leads to the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese Restriction Act of 1882, which goes on, uh, as many of you know, until 1943. So it wasn't until 1943 that Chinese could become naturalized citizens of the United States. But this sort of reflects the other side of this fascination with China, that both America wants to embrace China in many ways, connect with China, but also distance itself 
and wall itself off from China in various ways, sometimes simultaneously. And you can see this in some of the different writing at the time. This is in the late 19th century. The China, that war with the world is the cover of a book written about the Boxer Rebellion in 1900, 1899, at that time. And this is when there was a Boxer uh, uprising in northern China, uh, anti-foreign uprising, and to suppress it, um, a, a foreign powers formed a consortium, one of the first international consor consortiums of military strength, to actually invade China to go free their citizens and diplomats that were caught in Beijing. And you know the story if you've seen um, Charlton Heston and Ava Gardner in 55 Days of Peking. So that's how you can learn your history about that incident. <laughs> but that's the, the siege of Peking, the very famous siege of Peking. But China is being invaded, but the book has it sort of reversed. China at war with the world. So China, you sort of the sense that China is now warring with everybody. It's the yellow peril. And this was a famous pamphlet produced by the labor leader Samuel Gompers. A fascinating title just in and of itself. You can play around with it on so many different ways of who's strength, who's, who's powerful, who's weak, who's strong, and uh, who's male, who's not, and all this type of stuff, which uh, exemplified this sort of, um, again, this, this fear of the yellow other. Well, um, I'm going to move uh, more quickly here through some of the others. I can't summarize the entire book, but these are just to illustrate different moments in this to show these different dimensions. I do spend uh, a chapter about missionaries in China, and it's a, a very, very interesting story. And I have to say, after I did the research, uh, the book is, is, is directed to a non-specialist audience, I should say, because I really wanted to speak to a more popular interest in China and not just to specialists. But I think, I hope that specialists will also appreciate it. But it's meant to address, you know, more popular perceptions and interests in China. And in America, one of these is about the missionaries. And maybe so many of us don't know very much about missionaries in China. But thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of Americans, mainly white Americans, went to China beginning around 18, in the 18, late 1820s, all the way up through the next 150 years uh, and 140, 20 years to China to evangelize, to proselytize, to bring the Chinese people to Jesus. Um, and many people went there for decades, for their whole lives. They died in China, they served. And, and I think most missionaries are sort of seen as being very patronizing and not arrogant to go save the heathen Chinese from, from themselves. Uh, but after I started reading more about these missionaries, I came to have a different sense of many of them. As much as I didn't care for their, their, their arrogance, their, their cultural or spiritual arrogance, then many of them, I thought, actually were very dedicated and sincere people who wanted to help spread education. Many of them are medical missionaries. And we just met right now a colleague emeritus right here from the religion department whose parents were missionaries in China, and you were born in, in, in China and, and to, in a missionary setting. And the missionaries were very important because they lived for a long time in China and then came back and talked to Americans about, in every day, in all these churches all over the place, about life in China and made a special bond, I argue, between everyday Americans, not just business people and soldiers who were over there, but everyday mayor people in the churches in America. So you see pictures like this, and you go to Hoover Institution, there are scores of papers of returned missionaries who talk about their lives in China. Sometimes, and many times, in very fond ways, and this is sort of what I'm talking about, I have sort of a different view of some of the, many of the missionaries who I think were quite uh, dedicated to uh, trying to improve life. One of the most prominent of these is this man here named John Layton Stewart, who was very well known in the country in the 40s and 50s. His parents had been missionaries, and he himself lived in China for 50 years. He was born in China, he grew up in China, we came back, he was sent back, he was a southerner, he came back to, I forget which school, by his parents, and they called him a chink and so forth like this, because he 
had a Chinese accent growing up in China and dressed a certain way and his body language was so sort of, you know, very Chinese. And so he, some sense that he felt more Chinese than he did an American. But he spent his, almost his entire life in China and was a missionary educator. He founded Yanqing University, which is a legendary university in China that is now known as Peking University. And his campus outside of the northwest of Peking, which is where Yanqing University was, is where Peking University is. And Stanford Center at Peking University is just a, a, two blocks away from where he used to live. This is the famous water tower of Peking University, and some of you probably know uh, of, uh, of this tower. is the symbol of the campus. It's actually a water tower. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a temple or thing of this. And it was built by money uh, given by the um, CEO of Alcoa Aluminum in the 1920s. So these ties between Americans and Chinese, I think, were very keen uh, uh, through, 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 through this period and through the missionaries. When John Layton Stewart was um, near, advancing in years, um, he was made the ambassador to China in, uh, in 1947 or 48. And so he was the US ambassador in China at the time of the revolution. In 49, he had to withdraw. He was recalled from, uh, from China and came back to the United States and died back east somewhere. His dying wish was to have his remains returned and buried in China, next to his parents and his siblings. I mean, this is quite remarkable that people identify so much. And, and it's one of the themes in this book, that there's these strong chords between everyday people within the two countries. The PRC did not grant his wish for many decades. But a few years ago, they said yes. And his remains were returned and buried in China. Well, there are many aspects of the story. Uh, World War II, when China and the United States were friends against a common enemy. And uh, many Americans thought the Chinese were just like other Americans. They all had similar values. The, uh, the famous book by Pearl Buck, The Good Earth, sort of presented Chinese as hardworking farmers very down to earth, decent people who just wanted to be kind of left alone. And this sort of resonated with many Americans during the Depression years. The Good Earth came out in 1931. Uh, and then through the war years, you can see sort of this prototypical nuclear family um, uh, uh, that Americans were encouraged to support in the effort against Japan. But then that changes very quickly, of course, when the communists rise and triumph in 1949. And this cover on Time magazine uh, shows Mao as the so-called new red warlord, surrounded by the locusts, which is either could be the Chinese people, or sort of these minions of the warlord, but also a symbol, biblical symbol of pestilence and damnation. You have the locusts descending upon people. Or you also have a reference to Pearl Buck's famous scene of the descent of the locust on the, on the village. Anyway, it's bad. You have, <laughs> you know, you have, you have locusts. And you have, have Mao there. So now from friend becomes uh, an enemy. Time magazine itself, the publisher, was the famous Henry Luce, uh, uh, the, the great uh, 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 publisher of Time, Life, Fortune, and Cosmopolitan Sports, all in all of the whole Time Life. Henry Luce had brought, was brought up in China. He had been the son of a missionary. And his father, Henry Luce's father, and John Layton Stewart were colleagues in helping build Yanqing University. And Luce had a very, very deep attachment and fascination with China. But he was, unlike Layton Stewart, very, very conservative and worked with others uh, to try to rally Americans against uh, the PRC. <clears throat> well, there, there's a texture here. And at, some, and at the moment when Many white Americans most vilified China in the 1960s. Many believed that China was more dangerous than, say, the Soviet Union at the time because of China's appeal to the unwashed you know, third world, to the revolutions, to anti-colonial movements. But other Americans, particularly African-American activists in this scenario here, became fascinated with China and became um, enamored of Mao and revolutionary 
China. And here you see the famous intellectual, who's now a Ghanaian uh, citizen of Ghana, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was invited to visit China in 1962 or so for his 90th birthday. And so he became a, a guest of the state. And you see him here with Shirley Graham Du Bois up on the reviewing platform of China's National Day up there in the upper left. Standing next to them is Deng Xiaoping. Standing next to Deng Xiaoping is Zhou Enlai. And standing next to Zhou Enlai is Mao Zedong. I mean, you can't get much closer to power than, than that. And it's a, very, a fascinating photo here showing the, the Du Bois with, with Mao in an animated discussion. But Du Bois was not the only one. I mean, Robert F. Williams uh, lived in China for many times. When he died in Michigan, after you know, he wrote the Negroes with Guns book, for some of you who know, know this work, um, he was buried in a Mao suit right, because of his continuing um, fondness of, of, of revolutionary China. And even Huey Newton, you can see here in 1971, visited um, for China. I actually uh, met Huey in China, and I, I was there in China in 1971, and we crossed paths several times. And, and, um, the story, well, it was a fun story. So he, he, he had this immense bodyguard. And what he thought he needed a bodyguard for China, I'm not sure. But this guy was like, you know, New York Giants fullback, I mean, or his tackle or something. He was huge. And it was always round with Huey. And uh, the group I was with, there was another uh, Chinese American who was uh, uh, heftier, you know, on the hefty side. And Huey came up to me and said, Right, your bodyguard is almost as big as your pine. I said, <laughs> but he was, a, he was just, you know, a friend or something. <laughs> well, uh, uh, revolutionary China went its way after Mao died, and Deng Xiaoping rose, and you have the whole market revolution, and again, now Americans are reconnected to China, re-fascinated, and business in particular is interested, as Robert Rauschenberg cover of Time magazine now, uh, designed this kind of art piece to, to celebrate Deng Xiaoping as Man of the Year twice in the late uh, mid 1980s. And you'd see quotes such as the business people salivating to get back into the China market. And one businessman said, Just think of it one billion armpits in need of deodorant. You know, so this is, <laughs> so this is so this, again, this vision, this attraction. Still today, the two, two, two. Well, maybe they count shoulder. Maybe shoulder and didn't need it. <laughs> so you know, we had Apple today back there. You had you know, ban or whatever it was called, right guard or whatever. It was. Well, to um, uh, just to, to try to, to 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 finish up here, I am going to read a little bit here. Uh, for many Americans, China was from Jamestown to the present quote, now I begin a quote, a beguiling destination and an immense trading entrepot. But it also became seen in the eyes of many leading Americans through the years as essential for America's very own fate, and the fateful ties, or destiny, which is why I use in the book. The idea of China, the idea of China became an ingredient within the developing identity of America itself. And therefore, America's national de destiny, which preoccupies preoccupied and continues to preoccupy us. Americans are always interested about American destiny. Um, and became inevitably linked to that of China. America's destiny became linked to that of China in the great national enterprises and the expansive ventures of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. The Far East was the reason to reach the Far West the search for a Northwest Passage, the Lewis and Clark Expedition, the coveting of the Oregon Territory, the waging of the Mexican-American War, the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, the purchase of Alaska, the conquest of an insular empire in the Pacific, including the colonization of the Philippines, the Panama Canal, and others were all inspired in various degrees by the lure of China and Asia, and so on until we are, here we are today. So I also offer in this book a counter to the grand sort of Western move narrative that we have in American history. So this is not the end of the story in some sense, or the end of the history, but just the beginning. But to go back to the beginning, I give off you this, these slides. I asked some questions at the beginning of the talk of who some people were. Well, who is this? Very good. 
at the, at the other day on Saturday, no one knew who they was. 300 alums didn't know who this, this, this person was. This is Christopher Columbus. So where is this? Karen, uh, Pro Professor Wigan gets the A for, for her, the answer. Correct answer, Coit Tower. Now, what is Christopher Columbus doing in San Francisco? Why is there a statue to him in San Francisco? He never got close to San Francisco. The Italians of San Francisco, that's right. See, the closest Christopher Columbus got, of course, was somewhere near Cuba. And to his dying day, he believed he did make it to Asia. And he thought that where he was was sort of where Indonesia is. If you think of the latitude, it's sort of, sort of the same latitude. The problem was that Christopher Columbus misestimated by one third the circumference of the Earth. And of course, he didn't know the so-called New World and the Pacific, much of the Pacific. So that's why he thought he had made it the records with distance and was at the right latitude but he just didn't figure correctly in his calculations. To his dying day, he believed he, he came back to the New World twice after this, and to his dying, he believed he, went to, he got to the New World. But other people said, no, Chris, you know, you made a mistake. But in any case, he's looking here out, grand, heroic, a statue erected by the local Italian-American community in San Francisco in the 1950s to celebrate one of their own. And he's looking out, as you know, San Francisco, out towards the west, towards the setting sun. And he has a mandate in his hand from Queen Isabella, Stanford class of 72, uh, Sigourney Weaver, who plays Queen Isabella in, <laughs> in the movie 1492, with Christopher Columbus played by Gerard Depardieu. Uh, if, a long, turgid movie, except for one moment when Columbus meets native peoples, and a fascinating moment you know, changes the, everything when they meet. But on his um, scabbard, you can't see, uh, I, won't, I'm, I don't speak Latin, so I won't try to pronounce, but it's, it, it's translates as what he was supposedly has said, has, has said, search for the East by way of the West. His famous phrase, search for the East, capital E, by going West. And he's still going west. <laughs> I mean, he's still, he's still trying to go to the east by way of the west. Who are these people, and where is this? Who, who said Sacramento? Yeah, I'm near your hometown. Right? <laughs> yeah, Sacramento, the state capitol building, rotunda, beautiful, re renovated, and glorious. And who's the, who are these people? Can't see too. <laughs> Queen Isabella and Christopher Columbus. So what are they doing in the state capitol building? I mean, it's the same sort of thing, which if you, all, if you will be generous with me, is this sort of Italian, so maybe that's true. But it's the idea that, again, California and the West is embedded in this ambition, this vision, this impulse to get to the East. And we here are a way station. America is, in a sense, intimately linked to that impulse. I'll stop here and uh, welcome your comments and questions or criticisms. Thank you.